we have six national championships here. And we have two more that they didn't vote us. 66 and 77. Out of the eight, we have 12 SEC titles. Their record against Auburn was 17 and 3. We have three Hall of Famers, two law degrees. We have a 40 year corporate man who just recently retired from 3M and has started a new career in fishing. <laughs> We have an ESPN featured guy on 30 for 30. We have a real estate developer, and we have a person who knows the Bible as well as anybody that I know. In chronological order tonight, Bobby Johns. Bobby was an all SEC and all American defensive back in 65, 66, and 67. 65 national championship team. We won it in 66. I don't care. We don't play the ties around here. <laughs> that team allowed 37 points for the entire season. <laughs> And 37 points happens to be a good number for number 37. <laughs> and if he were here, there would be a guy that would take every bit of credit for Bobby Johns becoming All-American and All-SEC. That would be his that would be his position coach, Mal Moore. <laughs> On a personal note, when I was 10 years old, I snuck into the University of Alabama dressing room and got an autograph from my hero, Bobby Jones. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Bobby Jones. Next up is Ricky Davis. All SEC honors and a member of the 73 National Championship team. He is a sports attorney here in Birmingham. And uh, he holds a unique honor. And that is being a part of a secondary where all four positions were all SEC at the same time. Coach Bryant and Mal Moore would often say the three words, show your class. Ricky Davis has done that for the 45 years that I have known him. And on a personal note, I'd like to tell you something that happened a couple of months ago. Ricky Davis and I were having a conversation about one of our teammates joining or getting elected to the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame. And in that conversation, I asked Ricky, I said, do you mind if I write a nominating letter on your behalf? He deserves it. And Ricky Davis says, Andy, I appreciate that, but I wouldn't want a letter in my, on my behalf to interrupt what we're trying to do for my other teammate. That's Ricky Davis, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Murray Lake. The most low-legged defensive back in the history of the Southeastern Conference. An All-SEC member of the 1978 National Championship team and a member of one of the participants in Alabama's greatest defensive play ever, the goal line stand. I want to take this uh, moment to try to change a perception here, and that is about the goal line stand. 
that plague, three people got credit for attack on the final play. And two of them were defensive backs. One of them is on stage, and the other one is sitting right here, Mike Clements. <laughs> Bernie is a successful real estate developer, great guy. His father started the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame, was the director of that for many years. Please welcome Murray Lick. Uh-oh, Jim Bob Harris. <laughs> Y'all want to know why we keep beating Georgia's rump every year? Every time we play them, you have to look no further than here. Jim Bob Harris, an all-state quarterback from Athens, Athens, Georgia. His father worked at the business school, brother played golf there. Georgia should have known he was coming to Alabama because he had red hair and white outriders. <laughs> He's a member of the 79 and 78 national championship teams, played in the 315 game. Um, he worked for 3M and recently retired last month. And uh, finally, I'd like to add this note. Jim Bob and his son Truett, who played at Alabama, I think I'm right in saying this, hold the record for the most University of Alabama Athletic Department issued rings in the history of Alabama football. They hold 15 rings between the two of Jeremiah Castillo. Jeremiah played on the 79 National Championship team, the 315 game, and he secured Coach Bryant's last win by making an unbelievable pass breakup against uh, the University of Illinois. <laughs> Simply put, I have three stepsons. And out of any player, I've ever met at Alabama. I would like for my sons to grow up to be Jeremiah Castillo. Amen. He's one of the most humble men I know, and yet one of the most inspiring people I know. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeremiah Castillo. We have one that's in rank. Well, come on up here, Lee Osmond. <laughs> <laughs> Lee played in 87, 88, and 89. He led the SEC in 1988 with six interceptions. And many people remember Lee for his 98-yard interception against LSU of a two-point play that scored and, and turned the uh, momentum in the game. His teammates finally recalled that play by stating that Lee almost got a delay of the game penalty <laughs> during the play. <laughs> the LSU players were too tired to catch up to him, and the Alabama players were too tired to go hug him. He is the former law partner of Jimmy Sasser, chapter president, Ladies and gentlemen, Lee Osmond. Chris Donovan. A, a member of the 92 team, we all remember the infamous game where Brother Oliver put 10 defensive players on the line of scrimmage against Miami. 
We remember that. But the question I want to pose y'all is this. Do you remember Alabama's closest game in the 92 season? Well, yep. The one that I had in mind, though, was the Alabama-Tennessee game. And in that game, with one minute to go, with Alabama leading 17 to 10, there's a little guy, number 21, that makes an unbelievable interception to win the game. Chris and last but not least, as Coach Oliver would say, hot up, mighty nuts. <laughs> Antonio Lane. accomplishments are just simply gaudy. All SEC, all America, MVP of the first uh, SEC championship game, member of the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame, national championship in 1992, and one of the funniest and best personalities to ever wear the crimson jersey. He's unique out of this group in that Brother Bill Oliver and Coach Saban both coached him. He had an interception against Auburn, returned it for a touchdown, and Auburn hand caught him in. <laughs> he did the same thing against Florida. Won the game with that interception, and Florida hand caught him in. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, these are some of the eight greatest defensive backs to ever wear the crimson jersey. Thank y'all, and we'll keep looking. Now, Alabama has had these eight great players. We've had Don Hudson, Bart Starr, Namath, Stabler, Hannah, Newsom. Stevenson, Ingram, and Henry. We've also had national championship coaches. Thomas, Bryant, Stallings, and Sabre. And we have one other category where we are national championship caliber also. Names like Burt Bank, John Forney, Eli Gold, and tonight's Master of Ceremonies, Chris Stewart. Chris, come on. Up. That is uh, the nicest introduction I've ever had. <laughs> Let me tell you how much I appreciate it. And I'm going to do like y'all are doing. I'm going to sit out here with you because I'm going to enjoy this too. If I don't mess it up, I think we all will. Here's what I want to know, gentlemen. How many of y'all walked on campus at Alabama thinking you're going to be quarterbacks? That's what I thought. Now, how many on the back row are lying? It, it's crazy. Coach Johns, let's start with you. I say Coach Johns because that's what I heard my brother refer to you as for years, and that, that's how I know you. So tell me, and I'm sorry, should have handled that. Don't pass that around. How much has it changed? Because I'm going to guess there's a pretty good percentage of guys outside of the linemen that walked on to campus your playing days that were quarterbacks in high school, weren't they? Well, when I got down there, there were two other quarterbacks. I thought, Scott, you're not working. I missed dress rehearsal, Coach. I'm sorry. We're good? We're good. Thank you. I was just going to, I've told this story already a couple times, but when I went to Alabama, there were three quarterbacks on the freshman list. Myself, another guy from Mobile, another guy from Gus Shores, and his name was Kenny Stabler. Heard of him. 
<laughs> For some reason, they thought he was a better quarterback than I was. <laughs> That was a big disappointment. Still struggling to get over that. <laughs> but when I got to Alabama, what I realized, I started looking around and getting to know the players. About half the players were quarterbacks who had been told before they got to Tuscaloosa that they would be another position. So that was the trend. They would, they would sign quarterbacks and running backs and move them into those other positions. Rick, it's amazing how they tell you when you when they're recruiting you, how wonderful you are. Then for about two weeks, every, they're breaking you down pretty quick, aren't they? Well, they didn't tell me. They just told me when they recruited me uh, that they would put me where they thought that I could help the team the most. And so they, nobody ever said, you're going to come in. But they did say, our, see, our freshman year, if you remember, uh, in 71, was when Coach Bryant made the decision to go to the wishbone. Sure. And like Bobby, I was kind of when I dreamed of going to Alabama, I wanted to be the next Joe Maynard. You know, that was what I envisioned doing. And then I get to Tuscaloosa, they go to the wishbone, which was not the offense that I wanted to run, but I didn't really have a choice. Didn't have a choice to play quarterback. But then also, um, I was put on defense. But, uh, you know, Coach Oliver, who a lot of these guys played for, uh, you know, back then, you're, as a freshman, you weren't eligible to play on varsity, so you had the freshman year, we had the freshman team, and you were the, more or less the punching bag for the varsity. You know, because it didn't matter if you got hurt because you had a year to get well. Right. But, uh, but uh, Coach Oliver was a tremendous coach. I think all these guys, I mean, he was the play, you know, four years in the NFL. He was the best position coach, defensive back coach that I've played for anywhere. But, uh, but yeah, I, I wanted to play quarterback, and it took me about a year or so to get over that. But then uh, the long run, it worked out best. Murray, you were, you were a coach's son. So when you wound up in Tuscaloosa, you were used to the head coach going, son, you're going to do whatever's best for the team regardless. It don't really matter what you want to play. Uh, isn't that pretty much what, what you kind of grew up with? It is. Um, when I signed, there were, there were five people who signed a quarterback when I signed. And of course, Jeff Rutledge was one of them. Right. And so um, when I went down there, Jeff went to the varsity. The four of us stayed on the, on the junior varsity team or the freshman team. And so it wasn't until that spring, but during that fall, I played running back, I played split in, uh, I played some, some free safety, some strong safety, so I didn't know where I was going to be. Right. Uh, but um, they moved me in the spring to the strong safety, and that's where I stayed. Jim Bob, were you disappointed, or did you kind of know what you were going to get when you got moved? <laughs> well, there's a couple of things. You know, coming out of Athens, Georgia, the first thing that Coach Brown forgot to tell me is, he had already signed three other All-American quarterbacks. <laughs> he, he failed to, to drop that in on you? That was not part of the That wasn't a whole in-home visit. He went right in that fight. And we had Jeff Rutledge and Stephanie Sheely and Don Jacobs, Alan Gray. So it didn't take a couple of weeks. It took him about three days to call me up in his office. And, it, it, and he had some unique uh, words that I learned uh, playing with Coach Bryant. He said, son, you can stay a quarterback and we'll let you run the meat squad which is about the third string offense playing against the first team defense, and that's no fun. Or we'll move you over to defensive back and maybe you get to play a little football. And he said, we'll leave your quarterback till you holler calf row. <laughs> so I had to look that up and figure that out, but I told him right up front, I'd rather move and have a chance to play and be a part of the team if I could. Right. Hand that to Antonio, because I got have fun with us like anything else. You didn't want any part of quarterback, did you? Because they hit the quarterback, and I've had enough conversation with you. You didn't want to hit nobody, and you didn't want nobody hitting you. Is that correct? Well, actually, I was recruited as a wide receiver, and I probably had the shortest stand of any player up here in the position. We started our first day of practice, and we had a 10-minute end endo period, and I went through the endo period at wide receiver, and then we go to Wilson for the next period, and Coach Oliver called me over there with him, and I said, I'm supposed to be going to receivers. And his statement to me was, if you want to catch the ball, that man intercept it. You can win it all you want. That was the end up for me, a wide receiver. <laughs> I thought I was a wide receiver until I looked over the coach off in that second period, and that was it. So I became a wide receiver on the other side of the ball. Chris, there had to be a time you were quarterback somewhere. But when did you, when did you make that move? Well, actually, actually, we probably get this. As y'all know, I started my career at Vanderbilt. Yeah. And coming out of high school, I was uh, a quarterback, signed with Vanderbilt to play quarterback there. So same as, as these guys. 
So I, I always dreamed of playing quarterback. I signed with Vanderbilt as a quarterback and went through the first morning two-a-day practice. And just like Antonio got called up the coach's <laughs> office, said, we think we're going to move. And I was like, was I that bad? I mean, <laughs> wow. So yeah, I was a quarterback through high school. And obviously when I got to Vanderbilt, I was a quarterback. And that lasted a half of practice. I, but that's probably, I, we had to, I know we got a lot of insur life insurance agents in here. Quarterback at Vanderbilt, that was good to get moved quickly, wasn't it? <laughs> Very much so. Okay. They were running the triple option at that time, and uh, that was not probably a safe plan there. So I, I think I got the better end of that deal, without question. I'm just picturing you guys with the defensive back the size of Lee Osmond. Hmm. It in. Did, did you, you never got stuck at, at quarterback Lee, did you? <laughs> no, I mean, never Pee Wee anything? No. I, um, okay. I, I, I came to Alabama as a wide receiver. That's what I played. I never played deep, defensive back. Well, good luck. Gave my life. How much did they have to lie to y'all to get y'all on campus? Because they know that you brought in as a DB. <laughs> Coach Perkins had his ways. Yes, yes, he did. <laughs> that he did. Uh, but I, I started off at Alabama actually at tight end. Because I was a little bit See that? bigger than a wide receiver, normal wide receiver, so I played tight end. The kickoff classic back, I was number 81. And I was uh, I was playing off tight end from Howard Cross. And uh, we had some injuries. Rory Turner got hurt. Uh, Sean Lee got hurt. And then Coach Perkins calls me in. I thought I was in trouble. He says, hey, you ever played DB? I said, no. He said, uh, think you can play? I said, will he get me on the field? He said, it might. I'll do it. So, play defensive back. Loved it. A lot of you, a lot of you guys, y'all look good, good shape. I still contend, I said to somebody the other day, the guy sitting next to you, Jeremiah Castile's the one. I don't know how many plays he could play, but I guarantee you, if we're going to go one, he still, you still got one left to you, don't you, Jeremiah? I got one with more. <laughs> My apologies for the insult there. Um, if you hadn't been who you were, and that's a legendary NFL DB, what would you have played? Waterboy. Waterboy. <laughs> it was all or nothing in, in DB. <laughs> why, did you, why did you like it so much? Why was that the right spot for you? Because I love him. That's why you're on one end of the table and Antonio's on the other. Is that <laughs> And so you get far away from me. Now it all makes sense. You love to hit, so you, want to, you weren't big enough to play on line or linebacker, so you got back there and got a run and start. Is that basically right? Yeah. Is your style now, I mean, excuse me, the style you played then, it would still work in today's game, wouldn't it? For you, start there. Murray's already said, yeah. So how about for you? Is the game, what they're doing on offense, change or what you did and what you were taught it would still apply in today's game if we could drop your your 19. I would wear that weight today. I bet you would. I will wear it only instead of what 19 is if you're about 50 would yeah. <laughs> I mean, with the way they throw the ball today. Yeah, you've been a lot of picks. Yeah. 